and they are small and slim. So the people questioned, could they do this manual work, this hard labor? But this experiment proved that the Chinese are very able, and they work collectively you know, together using their very primitive tools. Okay, they use this uh, bucket, right? Uh, uh, this uh, wooden uh, stick. Yeah, they carry carry the heavy load. It's small, but they're strong. Mm -hmm. And they work together, prove they're very effective. Then the railroad owners <coughs> began to hire large scale Chinese work. So it ended up being that 90% of the railroad workers on the west part were Chinese, okay, more than 10,000. But when the railroad was, uh, this construction was over in 18, 1869, Chinese are not needed anymore. Okay? So as a result, Chinese must go. Why? We have these slogans, a lot of political cartoons. Says so that Chinese must go. Where do they go? Some are really went to China. But most uh, stayed. Uh, some are absorbed in uh, agricultural farms on the West Coast. But many more also left the West Coast because on the West Coast, uh, on the West Coast in 1870s, there was a very strong anti-Chinese sentiment. And in 1880s, 1882, this anti-Chinese legislature, okay, anti-Chinese law was passed in Congress, the so-called Chinese Exclusion Act. So the Chinese were chased, you know, they were uh, physically, uh, physically assaulted humiliated, and their settlements are burned, set on fire. You probably know, you know, for those of you who are in the field, you, you must know all this, uh, these tragedies, what happened in Chico, what happened in LA, right? The uh, riot in LA, many Chinese uh, houses were set on fire. The Chinese merchants, <laughs> their fingers were cut off because there's rain there. The, uh, the attacker trying to get the rain off the finger but couldn't get out to this top. So the many incidents like that. So this frightened the Chinese run, right? run away from the west coast, and then they came to south. Some landed in sugar plantation in, the, in, in, in south. Uh, some ended up in Midwest, such as Chicago and St. Louis. But many more people came to Chicago than to St. Louis. The reason is just as I mentioned before, Chicago is a great transportation hub. Just like uh, Margie. Margie had a, a lot to take Amtrak. But your great, great <coughs> grandfather also took the train, right? Yeah. Because the Chinese, yeah, built the train. <laughs> yeah, they, they rode the train, but not as comfortable as the train you rode. Uh, they, they came and they made their home here. And also, also because other reasons, uh, Chicago was architectural capital, right? Initially, Chicago was a, a rural town. People built a house in wood. Because of this wooden structure, structure, the big fire in 18, what year? One. Yeah, big fire, right? Conflagration in 1871. Burned the city almost into the ash. But the Chicagoans re uh, rose up from the ash. And they found out, and as a result of the tragedy, they created this uh, vertical expansion structure, okay, which is a high rise building. Okay, so, because of that, Chicago is the capital of architecture. People come here to learn to admire all this high rise building. And, but more importantly, you know, Chicago is the economic center. And oftentimes people like to see the New York's economic power or, or LA, but uh, I um, second uh, with a lot of scholars. For example, uh, William Cronin. Does anybody know William Cronin? Yeah, he wrote Nature's Metropolis, right? Na Nature's Metropolis. Uh, I think that he's currently at the University of uh, uh, Wisconsin Madison. Okay, he's a geographical historian, and he first wrote the book about the, uh, the native virgin land in, in New England area. And then this uh, nature's metropoly won a lot of uh, awards, a very highly claimed book. So in this 
book, uh, he didn't talk about the Chicago's industry or the urban center, but he uh, realized or uh, recognized one importance of Chicago, which has been neglected by many. That is, Chicago in connecting coasts right, is in the hinterland. But because of its central heartland location, Chicago connected uh, U.S. economy on the East Coast and the West Coast, made it a whole. Okay? Chicago also connected rural and urban. A lot of all kinds of manufacturing, I mean, uh, agricultural produces, right? Dietary produces, lumbers shipped to Chicago, we processed here, then redistributed to other places. So Chicago was known as a processing and distributing center. Meat packing, right? Food processing, manufacturing, steel, all produced here, processed here, and distributed to the other part. Of it. So because of this uniqueness, you know, uh, uh, William Crown recognized this connectedness. Chicago connected all these important elements together. So Chinese came here, like the other immigrants, to make money, to make their fortune. But why do they like Chicago, not other place? We can uh, use the quote of uh, Margit again, Margit's great grandfather. Okay, the so-called or three Moy brothers. We have three Moy brothers in Chicago, but also we can find maybe three Moy brothers in New York or in Indiana, because Moy is numerous. Moy is around the world. Right now, there's an international Moy's Association. There are many of them, they have a branch. But here in Chicago, the Moy's were numerous, and they were started by the three brothers. First brother was Mei Dong Choi. Uh, about the spelling of name, there are different variations. I, am, I was confused, I, like everyone else. Some have uh, Mei T-O-N-G, okay, Mei Tong Cho, of some is Mei Dong Cho. There's various pronunciations, spellings. <coughs> Finally, I compared them. I decided to use the version I have here, which is also in, in the book. <coughs> and that is also consistent with uh, uh, museum, okay. the Chinese American Museum's book. Do you have a copy of so, you know, the pictorial book? Is this version. And also, uh, the, mu uh, the, the National Archive, okay, the <coughs> Immigration, immigration and naturalization uh, service records use this version. So that's why I decided to uh, land on Mei Dong Zhou, Mei Dong Hoi, and Mei Dong Yi. But the Chinese version has only one. Okay? Uh, from these original documents, I saw their signature. They were all educated. While many illiterate Chinese just draw a cross, Shi Zi Hua Ya in Chinese, right? You put your thumb, right? In the ink, that's your signature. Or you draw a cross, that's your signature. But they all had their real <coughs> good handwriting, good penmanship. Okay? So they are not dirt poor, they're not illiterate, ignorant, but they are, I think, quite educated, probably merchants. You know, this origin, I think we can explore more. But anyway, uh, from the historical records, we know that Mei Zhongzhou first landed in San Francisco. Just like other Chinese followers, they were chased out. Excuse me. <coughs> they were chased out by anti-Chinese sentiment. So they decided to come to the Midwest to try their luck. <coughs> Even the Chicago was cold. Those Cantonese are not accustomed to this rigid winter, okay? because Canton was a tropical, subtropical weather. And California also was temperate. Okay? So compared to those two places, Chicago was whole, cold. However, the social climate in Chicago made it warmer for them. Okay? Because the uh, Chicagoans didn't chase them out. Uh, on the contrary, Moi Dong Zhou recalled after many years, in 1926, when he was interviewed by, by Qing, uh, 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 Qiu Qingfang, and he said, 
Okay, I put this quote here. So they never asked me whether or not I ate rats and snakes. Because Chinese are known <coughs> as dog eaters or rat eaters, right? Mm -hmm. Cat, rat eaters, snake eaters. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the typical images associated with Chinese. So dehumanize them. So he said, they did not ask me if I eat rats uh, or snakes. They seemed to believe that we also had souls to save. And those souls were worth saving. So that was his feeling, and I think probably we still feel the same way today. So Chicago is a really unique city. And I see it has dual personality, or double personality, right? So it has the personality of a cosmopolitan as well as a heartland, right? It has a personality of the uh, sophistication of a uh, large city, but meanwhile, it has the warmth and the simplicity of the heartland, the Midwesterners. <laughs> so because of this unique combination, uh, the, May, uh, May Dong Zhou and his uh, entourage like the Chicago. And they stayed here. Uh, Chicago, uh, May Dong Zhou pretty soon brought all his brothers. Then he wrote a letter to his country fellow men in San Francisco. And many men came. And eventually, about 100 of his uh, clansmen came. By uh, 1890s, there were more than 500 Chinese in this old Chinatown on South Clark Street. But the Chinese there, uh, the, another reason why the Chinese were not prejudiced against, partly is because Chicago was very cosmopolitan, very diverse already. Uh, to borrow Upton Sinclair's work, Jungle. I think everybody knows that work, right? Jungle. <coughs> About the meat packing industry mm -hmm. in Chicago that the term people studied mm -hmm. So use this jungle the term. The Chicago was multi-racial jungle. You have all kinds of nationalities, right? As I said earlier, so Germans, Irish. Okay, forgive me. This is a looks like a random order, not by alphabetical order or by geographical order. But this is a chronological order. Okay. So this order indicated the time of arrival of the different groups of immigrants. Germans, Irish, British, Canadians, Swedish, Norwegians, Scottish, Poles, uh, Italians, later on, African Americans, blacks, and then Asians, Chinese, Filipinos, and then <coughs> Japanese, Koreans, Southeast Asians. So another reason they, uh, they were not uh, uh, opposed or prejudiced is because it's diverse, this diverse mix. So Chinese very easily get lost. They were overshadowed. Okay? Use uh, Professor McCune. Right? I forgot to mention it. Another historian who graduated from the University of Chicago wrote also wrote a great book. Right? But it has one chapter on Chicago. It's a book that covers uh, Peru, Hawaii, and Chicago. So he said the Chinese were overshadowed by other <coughs> ethnic groups, right? No wonder. Um, Susan, you know very well, you know the early Chinatown was, the downstairs was the Chinese uh, uh, grocery store, and upstairs you have Chinese associations headquarters. <coughs> then next door you have some gambling house, couple of pubs, a lot of the pubs, you know, saloons in that area, right? So that little area was, Red light area, you know, it's a place of vice, a place of sin. <coughs> People go there, get drunk, get crazy, get lost, lost the money, lost the soul, lost everything. You know, there's a story about the laundry lost and the went back in the gamble. <coughs> so the Chinese there, you know, nobody knows, notice that. And the Chinese initially actually the work come, the <coughs> missionary. The missionaries welcome to them, yeah, and try to evangelize them, to save those heathen Chinese. And the uh, Sunday schools organize the programs, teach the English language. Uh, I found a lot of good uh, newspaper articles in 1870s, 1890s, 18, 1890s. Uh, the earliest one dated in 1870s or 1880s. Very, very early. Uh, I had initially I had 